Uh, we have three panelists today, so I think I'll get um, started right away. Welcome to the CRC Roundtable, our virtual uh, monthly seminar series. Um, again, our, our intention is to um, host targeted, inclusive, and informed conversations. So uh, the Roundtable is designed for conversation, not consumption. Um, and to honor that, uh, we give our panelists only about 25 minutes to make remarks, and then uh, we allow 30 minutes for discussion, which is facilitated out of the chat. And so this is really all about us and, and given us a place to be a little bit clumsy in our questions and, and to sort of practice um, bravery and humility. So I start um, every roundtable with just talking about why this topic at this time by these speakers. I'd say the fusion of art and scientific inquiry is, is not new, and that's beautifully uh, represented by Leonardo da Vinci's work that really showcased the synergy between both disciplines at a pivotal time in history. Um, I would argue that we are currently at a similarly pivotal time where societal challenges require global understanding of science concepts. And we also need to move large numbers of people to action. And that seems to be very effectively done through stories. So a, a reflection, I think, of, of this being a pivotal time is the rising trend of incorporating visuals in science communication. And we recognize that there are lots of other art forms um, in science communication. And if you've never checked out the uh, NSF-sponsored Dance Your PhD contest, I'd encourage you to do so. But today we're talking about um, visuals primarily. Um, and so the speakers um, are going to help us really unravel the power of images to both convey complex ideas and make scientific concepts more accessible to a very diverse audience. Um, they represent a range of approaches to the same objective, which is to converge art and science to amplify understanding and foster a deeper, deeper appreciation of our natural systems. Um, while they all have very large toolboxes and do all kinds of communication, each is gonna provide a unique aspect of using visuals uh, Lauren Yui is a graphical artist providing visuals to convey concepts to a wide range of stakeholders. Will Parsons is a visual storyteller tasked with engaging a wide range of stakeholders across the watershed. And Annie Carew uses visuals to provide a strong sense of context um, to residents. Um, so without further ado, again, I'll just mention that um, we got wonderful questions submitted ahead of time. I have those as well as um, questions that you'll put in the chat. Just to remind you that um, if you don't hear your question being answered during the roundtable, um, we follow up with the panelist and hopefully we can provide answers to all of those questions in a follow up along with a link to the recording. And so with that, I will turn over the floor to Lauren. Thank you, Denise. And thank you everyone for being here. I know December is a very busy month, so I appreciate your time today. Um, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about how we use visual communication at Greenfin Studio. So first to give you a little bit of background about Greenfin, uh, we are a small women owned business and it's um, we focus on envir mar environmental marketing and communication. Um, so we work with clients from um, federal agency is all the way down to local nonprofits with academic groups. Uh, we work with the CRC. And I'm glad to be here speaking at the webinar today. Um, and we focus solely on environmental communication. So it's really speaking to these environmental messages. Our entire team has a background in science, uh, which is really helpful because when we're talking to clients and helping them communicate their messages out, they're not having to communicate their science to us and then us trying to communicate it out to the general public as an audience, um, for example. So there's not that double translation there. We can come into the process already understanding and having that background in science. Um, and of course, we have our communication best practices and, and that's what drives our work. Uh, for this webinar, I wanted to make sure I defined um, what we're talking about when we say visual communication at Greenfin. 
Um, so it means that it's communication where the key messages are presented as imagery. Um, there's usually words involved in some form, whether it's spoken words in a video or text, uh, but the primary purpose of the product is to be viewed. Um, so it can include photography, videography, illustration. Um, there's a lot of different expertise on our team, um, including things like uh, GIS and map development, as well as web development. Um, and we all kind of wear many different hats. So I know there's other members, the Greenfin team uh, in the audience. So if you have questions about things that aren't the graphic design that I deal with, um, I'm happy to try and answer them or we can you know, get those answered from the rest of the team. So at Greenfin, we use a lot of visual communication, um, mostly because it makes science more accessible. Um, so I mean that in a few different ways, um, I've highlighted three here, it helps you reach broader audiences. So people who are not really going to be going and reading a scientific paper um, that can be the general public. It can even be members of the scientific community that aren't in that specific expertise um, that we're talking about. So it really broadens the audience. Everyone's interested in looking at an engaging visual at a pretty picture um, and it, it draws people in. It also reduces the time required to understand um, so if you hand someone an infographic and a page that's filled with text, they're more likely to look at the infographic um, and actually get some takeaways from that, as opposed to trying to skim that text in a small amount of time. Um, and that helps us reach busy people. And honestly, everyone is very busy these days, even the general public. Um, if they're scrolling on Instagram, they're not staying in one place for very long. Um, so reducing that time required is, is really important for communicating environmental messages. Um, but it's also important for people like decision makers who might have a lot of things coming across their desk on the daily, and we're really trying to make an impression with them. And along those lines, uh, visual communication tends to be more memorable. So you're more likely to remember um, a photo that you've seen of a beautiful landscape or you know people playing in, a wa in the water um, rather than you know a, a text document that's describing that. Um, and that can be better for behavior change, which is often a goal of our clients um, to get people to install riparian buffers or to stop littering. Um, so those behavior change messages can be strengthened by using visuals as well. And then I've put these icons on the bottom just to do a reminder that I am a graphic designer, and that's a lot of uh, what I end up doing at Greenfin, um, but visual communication can take a lot of different forms. So that can be videography, it can be making maps, um, it can be web development, photography, um, and even traditional arts definitely have a place in science communication as well. So for the rest of the time that I have, I'm going to just go through two quick examples. I have many others that I'd love to talk about. Um, so if we have time, I'd love to drop them in there or um, you know, maybe during the discussion they'll come up. But the two I'd like to focus on today are a story map that we made for the Nansaman Indian Nation called Indigenous Life on the Nansaman River. And then the second one it was about ecosystem-based fisheries management for the New England Fisheries Management Council. Um, and that was a few different um, types of media. So We'll get to that. Um, but first, the indigenous life on the Nansaman River. So that QR code in the upper right, um, if you have your phones and you'd like to scan it, we'll take you to the story map. Um, but we'll also drop that link in the chat. So this project, uh, the objective was to assist the Nansaman Indian Nation in telling their story of stewardship, displacement, and then the journey home and healing. Um, and that was really important to us to help empower people whose stories are often um, forgotten or intentionally kind of put to the side uh, to be able to tell their own story um, in their own words and just really be there to assist with the communication side of things. Um, the audience for this product was pretty wide. It was meant to be a general educational tool. I know it's been used in classrooms as well. So teachers were an audience um, to use this tool to teach their students. Um, and a lot of people did end up seeing it through, uh, it was a finalist for the Webby's People's Voice Award um, up against uh, products from Patagonia and NASA, um, which unfortunately we did not win that one with this product. Um, 
but it did win second place for the 2022 Tribal ArcGIS Story Maps Challenge. Um, so lots of people were getting eyes on this um, and learning about the, the journey of the Nansaman Indian Nation over the years, which is amazing and kind of why we do this work. Um, and the, the last audience I wanna mention for this product was other tribes. So the client here was hoping that this would be a template that others could follow, um, laying out a narrative and a way to communicate your story um, that then they could just take and follow and make it easier for them to, to go through that process. Um, so this one I'm really proud of because we were able to make some very cool graphics. So on the right, um, that is some traditional beadwork um, that uh, represents the crabs in the ecosystem. Um, and I was able to take that and kind of put it into a, a digitally created, you know, stylized background um, to really mesh this traditional art form um, and bring it kind of, it just give it different dimension and, and highlight it on the story map. Um, and there were a few few things throughout the story map that we were able to do like that, bringing in um, like traditional line work tattoo um, overlays on some of our graphics. Um, it was just a very cool process to, to see those two come together. Um, there was also a lot about the science of their, uh, the restoration that they're trying to do. So there's some slides about oysters and oyster habitat and restoration. Um, and then there's a lot of maps, which have some drone imagery, um, both video and photography. Um, so there's a map tour that goes through the important places um, along the Nansaman River. Um, so that's one product that I wanted to talk about. A lot of graphic design, a lot of photography, videography um, in this digital format. Um, Lauren, if you can have about another minute or two. Yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this one as quickly as I can. And this is the last one. Um, so the New England Fishery Management Council brought us on board to talk about ecosystem-based fishery management, um, which is just a different, different style of management where you're not looking at individual species, but more of the ecosystem as a whole. So you're looking at that species you're interested in fishing, as well as the prey species for it or the predators of it, um, and, and managing that as a whole ecosystem. Um, so this project, uh, we were trying to explain ecosystem-based fishery management, or EBFM, um, as a concept to a broad audience, but also to specific affected stakeholders. So you can see some of them on that graphic at the right. There's fishermen and seafood dealers, commercial and recreational fishermen, NGOs and the public. And this graphic on the right was really cool because it was a way to visually show uh, the overlap between these different groups that might think they have nothing in common. So a non-government organization and um, fishermen, for example, well, they have a common potential positive in EBFM of more forage for predators, which is good for both of those groups. They're both interested in seeing that. Um, so laying everything out in this visual way really helped make those connections across these stakeholder groups. Um, and I'll just, I'll leave it there, but there's a lot more I could say. Um, and we made videos as well, but I'll pass it on to um, Will, who'll be going next. Oh, thanks, Lauren. Um, Will, you're on deck. Thank you, Lauren, and, and thank you, Denise. Um, bear with me, obviously, I'm a little gravelly, I'm getting over cold, but I, I think I can power through today. Um, hello, everyone, my name's Will Parson, and um, actually, I'm gonna share my screen, so one second. Alrighty, so my role is the uh, multimedia manager for the Chesapeake Bay program. I'm staffed by the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, but um, my role is 100% um, committed to the Chesapeake Bay program, which if you're unfamiliar is sort of like the potluck of uh, agencies uh, or nonprofit or organizations and academic institutions that leads and directs the, the Chesapeake Bay restoration effort, the watershed restoration effort, um, guided by the 2014 Watershed Agreement. So um, a lot of people who are um, familiar with my work think I'm out traveling the watershed uh, every day, uh, making photos, working on videos. Um, in truth, I'm in the office most of the time, researching and editing, trying to figure out 
uh, where to go next. Um, there, there's a saying about uh, interesting photography comes from uh, not you know not necessarily special skills with the camera, but um, doing a lot of work to put yourself in front of interesting things. So um, you know. Uh, this on the right is, uh, little orange dots. Uh, this is my photo editing software. Um, uh, all the photos that we make are, are geotagged. So these, these little dots represent, um, photo assignments. So it's at this point, after about 10 years of doing this, it's starting to take the shape of the, the watershed there. There are definitely some spots where I haven't visited. Um, I, I'm always trying to think of representation, both uh, geographically, as well as uh, um, diversity across the spectrum. And also, uh, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'm uh, always an outsider coming into different parts of the watershed, uh, which is is inherently going to introduce bias. Um, there's uh, only so much, even with you know, professional training, that I, I can do to avoid that. So I'm, I'm always trying to encourage um, more visual storytelling efforts. Um, visual storytelling for me uh, is um, coming from a photojournalism background, uh, using a combination of photo, video, and text, uh, and figuring out the, the best combination of those to tell a story. Um, and that is a cow pie that I'm filming for a story on soil health, by the way. <laughs> so we publish uh, our uh, storytelling in a, a few different places. Our, our flagship website for the Chesapeake Bay program is uh, chesapeakebay.net. Um, we have social media accounts. Uh, I, I manage our Instagram. Uh, we also post to Facebook and Twitter. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on our Flickr archive in a, a second. And then our uh, videos appear both on our website and then they're hosted uh, across Vimeo and YouTube. And I can drop links to these in the chat after I'm done. So a lot of people are familiar with uh, my work through our uh, photo archive, which we make publicly available for non-commercial use uh, with written permission. So uh, we take requests at requests at chesapeakebay.net. Um, there, you know, uh, I feel like cultural culturally nowadays people are um, a little too used to downloading photos for free off the internet and assuming they can do whatever they want with them. There is a little bit of a learning curve there, but I'm always happy to um, answer questions as far as what is uh, you know, acceptable or not acceptable. And it doesn't hurt to ask. So if you have a use in mind and um, if you don't see, even if you don't see something in our archive, feel free to reach out. So photography is a, a broad arena for me. I, I think of photojournalism um, and uh, visual, visual storytelling in particular. Um, the, the theme of this webinar is art and science. And I, I always feel that uh, photography has a lot in common with science and that it um, has a commitment to fact-based uh, reporting. So it's, it's telling a factual story just in a different way. Um, what photography can contribute to those scientific stories is more of the uh, why should I care uh, element. So you might have the facts, but um, photography can help show you uh, not only what's at stake, but who's at stake. And so um, in that way, it can uh, confirm or challenge preconceptions if you have a preconceived idea um, about a, a topic in mind, sometimes a photo can, can challenge that. You know, if it's climate change and you're thinking, well, you know, it doesn't really impact me, it's something far away, uh, seeing a photo of your neighborhood underwater can really change things. Um, photography transports to people to, you know, places that they've never been. It inter introduces you to people that you, you might never meet in person. And so it's, it's really about establishing a personal connection uh, with an issue. Um, as far as being an aid to learning, um, it, imagery in general increases uh, our ability to remember facts. And, and not only that, but uh, the more your emotions are engaged, uh, the more you're going to remember. The, the more you, uh, time you're going to spend looking at a photo, the more time you're going to spend looking at the text next to it. Um, Photos and visuals reduce the barrier to understanding and um, 
you know, it, it's always a good idea to pair text with photos and, and vice versa. Um, I, I, I never use photography on its own. It, it always has that text element. So it, really the basic unit at the very least is a photo and a caption or a photo and a piece of dominant text. So as I was saying, photos and text always work together. Uh, uh, you know, focusing narrowly on the the you know printed or digital page of a you know feature story that we put out on our website, uh, your your eyes are going to go to headlines and photos first. So uh, you really want to capture people's attention. Otherwise, they might click away. They might not. They might not realize the story is for them. Um, that first photo in a story is is always really important and so a lot of work goes to um putting uh as much of the the story into into one photo uh as you can so that you have a, a a clear opener to your story um as opposed to just like one element after another uh you you know you don't want to overload a, a story with too many photos Will we you know probably that, have uh, a minute or two left. Is that going to work? Yeah, I'll uh, go through this slide and then uh, wrap it up. So uh, we know that more complex photos, uh, the more you layer elements within a photo, the more you're going to look at the photo. Uh, the more developed your caption, the more you're going to look at a photo. And uh, you want to intersperse photos with text to keep people interested. So I'm going to switch over to my um photo program to share a few photos so our our coverage um includes a a, a wide swath of you know landscapes uh, people places we have a partnership with south wings that's led to a lot of uh, aerials from across the the watershed. This is uh, the Susquehanna River and a tributary in Harrisburg. So you can see the you know the amount of development that's taken place in the watershed. Uh, impervious surface, Tangier Island development next to a forest. Um, aerials in particular have helped uh, cover the the issue of ch uh, climate change. Which uh, this this is a dead forest in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. These are all tr dead trees in what's now marsh and open water. We've covered climate change a number of ways, not just showing the problems of sea level rise, but also uh, and and the problem of urban heat islands, but also the solutions. And uh, that's another point I want to end on is um, it's always important to not just show the negative, but uh, really show a path forward. Whether it's a path some uh, person in particular is taken or um, you know an activity that people can pursue on their own so planting trees we've covered uh, in a whole lot of different areas and I'll uh, leave it there oh th thanks Will and I I had never really that's a great representation of the um, archive I'd never really um, that was that was great and I appreciate the point about um, showing both, if, if you're going to show the negative or the problem, show the path forward. And I think that's a great segue to um, Annie. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so uh, good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Annie Carew. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a science communicator at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science Integration and Application Network. Um, which is an organization that is a cadet branch of the University of Maryland system. And our work uh, encompasses a wide suite of activities from um, sort of a holistic socio-environmental assessment approach that we've uh, utilized in ecosystems around the world. And the uh, end result of those projects is a um, comprehensive and visually compelling uh, science communication product that we call a report card. Um, so that integrates photos, text, and some of the more conceptual uh, visual elements that I'm about to discuss. And then we also do um, uh, science communication training for scientists, students, and anyone else who might be interested. So for today, I'm going to focus on the idea of a conceptual diagram, which is something that I think 
um, maybe not everyone is familiar with. So um, slide advance, there we go. Um, so our definition is a conceptual diagram is a thought drawing that can be used to communicate complex environmental processes in, and concepts in a simple, easily understood format. I think that um, Will and Lauren both have touched on the importance and utility of visual elements when we're communicating science to a broad and diverse audience. Um, so conceptual diagrams we found have uh, are really excellent tools for communicating complex concepts because of that sort of visual engagement that pulls people in and is interesting to them. Um, so conceptual diagrams can serve a lot of different uh, purposes. They can provide important uh, context to environmental issues. Um, this diagram shows the Fiji archipelago in the South Pacific, and it provides not only the geographic context of this um, scattered group of islands and the ways that they uh, connect and interact with each other, but then also some of the uh, environmental issues that impact both the terrestrial part of that ecosystem and then also the uh, ocean. So you see um, processes like coastal erosion and sea level rise. You also see that there are ecosystems here um, like seagrass beds and coral reefs and mangroves. And then in the, the upper part of the diagram, um, I connected it back to the sort of larger geographic context. Um, so something like this contains a lot of information, but in a uh, interesting, compelling and informative um, visual format. So conceptual diagrams can also be used to synthesize data. Um, as in the previous example, a lot of environmental concepts and problems are very complex and maybe difficult to explain. Um, briefly and in a way that is engaging and comprehensible. So this um, slightly blurry graphic is a elevation and habitat type transect from Rock Creek Park, uh, Rock Creek National Park in Washington, DC. You can sort of see at the bottom of the screen here how the elevation changes across this transect. And then in the top part of the screen, you can see all of the different habitat types that are included in that transect. So what I did with this, um, with this elevation and habitat transect was I turned it into a conceptual visual representation of the um, the profile of Rock Creek Park. So this shows uh, the diversity of habitat types that are within the park. You see several different kinds of forest um, with the correct and relevant tree species included. You see that there is impervious surface in the park in the form of beach drive and of course other, other elements. And then the creek itself in the very center there. And you may not be able to see it on my screen, but there is a teeny tiny little fish swimming in that creek. Um, so something, a conceptual diagram like this um, synthesized a, a um, maybe slightly less interesting and compelling um, data-driven visual into something that is more conceptual, um, broad scale, uh, and, and is more more interesting and, and compelling and comprehensible for people to read without having, you know, without necessarily understanding what a topographic map looks like or what an elevation transect looks like. Um, conceptual diagrams can also illustrate change over time. We sometimes create multi-panel diagrams that show the ways that um, environmental changes and uh, human environments develop over time. So this graphic illustrates the change in um, precipitation over time, uh, specifically related to climate change, but we wanted to show how that increase in precipitation impacts um, runoff into the creek. If you look at the, the left-hand side of this, this diagram, you can see that there is runoff occurring in that the rain falls on the road, which is an impervious surface, and then washes into the creek. Um, if uh, rainfall increases and uh, no other changes are made, um, more water will run off into the creek and bring uh, sediment and other contaminants into that water. Um, so that just shows um, the way that the environment changes over time in a way that is uh, easy to understand and visually compelling. So I'd like to dive just a little bit into our process for developing conceptual diagrams. This is something that we've done um, around the world. We're very uh, focused on engaging with local stakeholders and people who live and work in a particular ecosystem because no one understands the issues facing an ecosystem better than the people who live in it. 
Um, so a key element of conceptual diagrams or really any piece of science communication or environmental education that you're developing is to identify your audience because that dictates um, both the, the message that you want to convey to people. Um, I think your message would be different for a lawmaker versus a private homeowner. And then also the, the language and concepts that you use and how much you will need to explain things. Um, like a, you know, a, a professional scientist, you assume a certain level of knowledge, a, a private homeowner or an educator or um, a, a policymaker is going to have a different kind of knowledge uh, background. And you need to be mindful of that as you're developing your product so that people can understand what you're trying to say. Um, and then for conceptual diagrams, we develop an issue statement, which is kind of the uh, takeaway message that we want people to get from the diagram. And then we sort of uh, sketch it out. We prioritize um, which parts of the system are the most important to get the message that we want to convey. So for example, in the impervious surface diagram example, a big part of that message is the impervious surface. So the road was a uh, large and necessary feature for that diagram. Um, and then we usually start with a hand-drawn sketch, as you can kind of see in the photos on the right here. Uh, and then we um, take that hand-drawn sketch and we develop it uh, with software. And at every stage of this process, we are talking to our project partners, talking to stakeholders, receiving feedback on the content and style of the diagram. Um, and it's a pretty pretty adaptive and iterative process um, that I, I, I really enjoy it. I love making conceptual diagrams. Um, so this is just a, a rough sketch of a diagram that was made in, I believe, Samoa. Um, and, you know, just a, a rough sketch done in, in person with stakeholders about what you want to include in the diagram. And then you um, start to create it in software. Uh, this diagram was made using Adobe Illustrator. And um, we at Ian have an entire... Uh, suite and repository of um, vector symbols and diagram bases, which are available for free online. Uh, and then from this sort of rough conceptual software sketch, you develop something like this, which is um, fully fleshed out. And then this one is, you know, particularly comprehensive and complex in that it has specific um, kind of call outs that address uh, very specific elements of the diagram. So it really is a very comprehensive um, Illustrative illustration of what's going on in the American Samoa, and um, it's very nice to look at. <laughs> and so that is all that I have um, to say about conceptual diagrams. Thank you guys so much for coming here today. Um, I mentioned our symbol repository that is available on our website, and I think um, we're ready for questions now. So thank you. Oh, thank you, panelists. You did a wonderful job of of allowing a lot of time for discussion, and I really appreciate that. Um, I, there, the questions, um, both in the chat and that we've got um, beforehand are, are really, some of them are, are just sort of technical, I think will be simple to answer and others are a little more um, involved. Um, and so I'm going to ask a couple of technical ones first. There's um, actually a, a wonderful question from um, Rebecca Burrell that says, can you speak to how you handle describing photos for visually impaired re readers using websites? So that's almost like, how do you translate it the other way? And and is that, have you had to do that uh, basically in, in your, um, you know, in your efforts? And so maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Annie, and go the other way. Uh, you, then Will, then Lauren. Um, we do use alt text for our photos on our website. Um, and any digital, any digital products that we use. Um, and we also, uh, depending on the project, we, we do use the, the colorblind color compliance uh, standards to make sure that we're not creating something that um, won't be understandable for people with those kinds of impairments. Great, Will, anything different than? So I, I can say that the BIA program has done a, a great job um, more recently to, to make all text more consistent across our website. So I can credit our web team for the, um, helping with that. Um, it's, uh, not, it's something that I, I used to never think about, um, 
and I I've always been focused on the the caption as like the the dominant text, uh, but it's it's something that I've focused on more and more. So I, for me, it helps to think of the the caption and the alt text as covering different things. So caption, you you actually very rarely want to describe in a caption what's obvious in the photo uh, from from looking at it. So the the caption is there to elaborate, to add context, to really like you know. Uh, drive the point home, whereas the alt text, um, you know, the alt text might be uh, more focused on uh, the what the figures in, in the picture are doing so that you can kind of paint that mental picture. Um, also, you know, in the scheme of things, it's all the more important to tell stories in different ways. So if something is really important, it's not just a, a photo story. It, it might be a, a video, and um, we haven't done pure audio stories, but uh, at least with our video, we tried to make it uh, an enriching audio experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. And um, Marjorie mentioned that the federal government requirements, and we do work with federal government. Um, so we are required to do lots of different um, compliance things, um, accessibility. Um, and I I think... Photos are not as hard for me to write alt text for as um, like graphs and, and data visualizations because you're trying to explain everything that's going on, um, you know, with something like a scatter plot. Um, and that is harder for me to wrap my brain around than um, kind of describing what's in a photo that comes more naturally to me or even in a graphic. But like, I mean, that example that Annie just showed, I can't imagine trying to summarize you know, that conceptual diagram in alt text. Um, so sometimes if we know that it's a document for federal government or, you know, who who the audience is, we'll try to make sure that um, kind of like Will said, we're including that information in different ways and we're not relying on a graphic um, that we're going to have to work really hard to, to make sure the alt text is just right for. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, a tricky question. Um, thanks. And I, I will uh, tell people that um, people have put, uh, I know, Annie, you put the the Ian library of icons in the chat. And um, I, I believe we'll put a, a link in there, too. So there are some links to some resources. Um, the next question I'm going to ask may, may vary, and I'll go the other way. I'll ask Lauren first. Um, so in each of what you do, what's the What's the easiest to use sort of easiest access tools available for making the particular type of thing that you do? So Will, it might be more photo editing, but Lauren and, and Annie it might be, um, you know, more, uh, I don't know, um, image based. So um, Lauren, what's, can you give somebody a, a place to start with an easy to use tool? Yeah, we find a lot of people like to use Canva for um, infographics, especially if you're just starting out. Um, it's pretty plug and play. It's an online website. You don't have to download any software. Um, and that's a great starting tool to kind of start getting an eye for how to lay things out on a page, you know, what fonts to use, that kind of a thing. Um, our team uses the Adobe Suite, which, you know, is a software you have to download, you have to pay for it. Um, and Canva is a great alternative if you're just starting out or if you only need to do visuals sometimes. So that would be my recommendation. Oh, thank you. Um, Will? So I I also use the Adobe Suite. And for, for photo work, I'm using Adobe Lightroom almost exclusively, which you, you have to pay for. I believe the smartphone app, however, is free. Um, I think there's some limitations as far as like the cloud storage, but um, that's a way to, especially since a lot of people aren't editing on their laptops anymore, um, you can start uh, toning and uh, learning how to read a histogram, that Lightroom app. Annie, how about you? And again, thanks for putting the link in the in the chat. Yeah, no problem. Um, I sort of touched on this when I when I um, promoted that when I you know shamelessly plugged the umc symbols in the chat. Um, but we also use Adobe Suite. Uh, but when we're talking about you know there's a there's a barrier to access there with the cost of the software. It's also maybe not the most user friendly. Um, not a learning curve so much as a learning cliff. Um, so I'd also recommend Canva. There's another website that we sometimes mention called um, Vecta, Vecta.io, 
um, that is also free and more user-friendly. I also have had um, pretty good luck with creating diagrams in PowerPoint at a pinch because um, you can put in shapes. Uh, all of the the Ian symbols will load in as um, as SVG files and you can move them around and do do whatever you need to do um, within that within that software space. All right, I'm going to combine a, a question from the chat here with um, something that was submitted um, before uh, beforehand. So the, the question in the chat is really wonderful. How do you decide what graphics visuals to post on social media? We found our audiences respond best to the quick and dirty videos from the field with minimal editing, especially if cute animals are involved and are more meh about videos or reels we spend hours working on to make fancier. I'm going to combine that with a question that's that's um, have any visual products you've done proven more effective than others, and how did you know? And so I'm, I'm Will. I'm going to put you on the spot first for this one. So uh, as far as knowing what's more effective, um, you know, with with the way you know. It works putting stories together and the editorial process. You kind of have to rely to some degree on just general you know, background knowledge of you know, knowing what kind of photos work better. You know, it's it tends to be more emotional photos, more intimate photos, as opposed to just like purely information, uh, like crime scene photo kind of approach. Um, and uh, uh, as far as what to put on social media, I, I definitely see a, a valley between like the quick and dirty video getting, you know, uh, having a lot of success or, you know, maybe moderate success, but you've put relatively little time into it. So it, it kind of has that payoff. Whereas if you spend a lot more time, it, it even if it does moderately okay, it's not quite worth the time. So we do our, we put our longer videos on a different platform, like, you know, our website where we have a different audience. And it's not quite competing with that social media um, algorithm, um, but you know there it's it's there's sort of a an audience for both at least as far as we're concerned. The, where it gets tricky is that middle ground. You don't want to spend like a moderate amount of time to put something that's like kind of okay because um, then it doesn't quite serve either purpose. Well, wow. so you kind of invest or or create according to the audience that that you think you're going to get on a different platform. Yeah. And I guess yeah. as far as like measuring success, you know, view count, um, kind of different scale, whether you're looking at social media versus YouTube or Vimeo or a website. Um, also, yeah, I get a lot of feedback uh, through the requests that come in for our archive. So I know that like mm -hmm. our photos of microplastics um, made back in 2015, they, they still get requested a lot um, as sort of clue into you know, the types of things that resonate and are useful. Uh, how about Lauren? Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely right. Is you're, you got to think about your audience. And in that question, you're saying your audience responds better to the quick and dirty on social media so that, you know, that's the approach you might want to take for them. Um, and um, as far as like metrics of success, um, besides things like, you know, engagements on social media, um, we always get really excited about, um, like requests to use products elsewhere. So we made, um, let me see, I can probably share my screen. We made this graphic for the upper and middle James Riparian Consortium about how an inch of rain on a forest produces only 750 gallons of runoff, but an inch of rain on a one acre of pavement produces 27,000 gallons. Um, and this graphic has been used by tons of different people. People keep seeing it, grabbing it and asking us if they can use it somewhere else. So like the Bay Journal used it, um, which was super exciting. And again, we made it, it, it's not necessarily quick and dirty. It still took some work to make, um, but it's these really like punchy visual where it's, you know, you're focusing on one main point for us, it's you're focusing on one main point. There's not a lot going on. It's, you know, really driving home this visual of an inch of rain on each of these areas is producing mm -hmm. way magnitudes of different um, gallons of runoff. Um, so one of our metrics of success is, you know, 
are people talking about it? Are people coming to us and asking for more things like it or to even reuse things that we've made? Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, a great example that has had quite the life beyond um, what we had made it for. Annie, how, how do you, you know, how do you know whether a conceptual diagram or maybe another kind of uh, visual that you've used works? And have you seen anything that's particularly effective? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think uh, Lauren and Will covered it admirably. I don't know how much I have to add. I know that we track um, downloads of our symbols and of our, our publications from our website. We do track our social media engagement. Um, I think recently we've been kind of uh, developing a new social media style, leaning more towards like an infographic about upcoming events rather than a photograph. Um, I don't know if that's more or less effective, but it is, it does require a little bit more like effort and graphic design on our end. Um, and as far as efficacy of products, I have seen our conceptual diagrams pop up in uh, unexpected places, um, which is always a fun little surprise. Um, and I think that something, there are diagrams that I've made for various projects that we just reuse um, over and over again, whether it's for a communication course, explaining to people what a conceptual diagram is and what it does, or for other um, talks and materials promoting, you know, whether it's it's the the project itself, the results of the project, or, you know, our uh, approach to science communication in general. Um, as far as, I mean, I think that something that is broad, concept and visually engaging is always going to compel people and will find a life beyond its initial purpose. Great. All right. Here's a, a, a great question for those of us that don't have the same skill sets that you all do. <laughs> um, how do you get data-driven scientists open to integrating art into their work and how they approach problems? So, um, anyone want to volunteer to go first? I, I'll go from the, the top of my head. I mean, what comes to mind is what we've talked about already, which is audience. You know, if a data-driven scientist is trying to communicate to someone usually, and they don't want to include art, um, it's often like, okay, well, who are you trying to communicate with? Really think about them and, you know, what their priorities are, what their day-to-day -day is like. And it's, you know, the classic example of like, okay, at, at dinner, are you going to talk to your grandma, you know, in these, these charts, are you going to pull up a, a plot and, and show her that, or would it make more sense to show her a photograph of your field site and talk about it, or, you know, mm -hmm. bringing in visuals that way. So I think we find often that it's thinking about audience and, and helping the client or the, the scientist who is, um, you know, trying to communicate really make that connection to audience and think about who they're actually trying to talk to and, and what's actually going to be appealing and understandable to them. Hmm. Will and Annie? Sort of related, um, but it, it what comes to mind are community science efforts that are have a, a photo element, like you know, contributing species to uh, iNaturalist or um, platforms like that where uh, the the photos are inherently part of the data and um, uh, it presents the opportunity to uh, once you have that data to to repurpose those photos in order to uh, promote the the overall effort mm -hmm. uh, and we we actually use iNaturalist photos on our website a lot for our field guide mm -hmm. so it's just top on on my mind I, I've seen other efforts where there's like a photo station where you can take your own photo uh, from a set location and it gives you like before and after data so that's a you know not not quite involving the scientists but uh involving the public in in the science hmm. annie anything to add um i would i would second lauren's point about identifying your audience and really kind of driving that point home to the scientist um i think scientists tend to get bogged down in detail uh and i think I found that sometimes it's proof of concept that kind of changes their mind about whether a visualization is worthwhile. Um, mm -hmm. If I make a conceptual diagram, uh, you know, with little to no prompting, 
and show it to them as as a way to illustrate a complex concept or system, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, let's that's great, let's do that. Um, so yeah, the uh, defining the audience and then kind of proof of concept are my responses to that question. Um, I'm gonna. Um, I think this is a really um, interesting question, and I I'm I think Will you might have referred to it or said the words in your presentation is or maybe our discussion beforehand, but you, you were talking about, um, you know, what you do is mirroring science as, as being um, fact-based reporting. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you all, there's a couple questions here is about um, what are sort of the, the challenges, the misinformation hurdles, or, um, you know, how, what do you think now about the fact that sort of fake visuals have gotten you know, easier, easier to do. So do you think you have um, the protocols in, in place to know how to recognize those or, or really how do you handle, is it a challenge for, for you and what you do? Visual misinformation? So for, for what I do, um, it's all the more reason to be uh, very clear about our, uh, Code of ethics. You know, I, I I follow the National Press Photographer's Code of Ethics. I don't influence scenes. Um, you know, there are exceptions where it's like maybe a portrait situation where it's obvious in the photo that you know what's going on. Um, but uh, we go to great pains to you know maintain that um, you know lack of misleading the 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 reader. Um, but on on you know the from the reader's perspective, I I think it. Um, it's it's all the more important to uh, emphasize literacy, not just you know literacy in general, but visual literacy, uh, you know, uh, for mm -hmm. for students. So um, there there have always been ways to manipulate both words and pictures, um, and uh, so it's it's a matter of developing critical critical analysis and critical critical thinking skills in students. Mm -hmm. I love that term, visual literacy. Lorna, Annie, anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I I agree. There there have always been you know ways to to misrepresent, um, especially with things like data visualization. Um, we have a set of best practices that we use to to try and make sure we're we're being clear, um, which is adapted from Edward Tufte. And if you haven't heard of him for data visualization. Um, can look him up. Um, so we do have kind of best practices in place that we follow to make sure that we aren't misleading people. Um, but I think um, that doesn't mean it's not happening. And I'd say um, yeah, the the literacy on behalf of viewers is is the important thing there. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how we teach that, um, but hopefully. Um, in college and, and maybe even in high school, these these things are being discussed to to try and build up that literacy and and help people from being misled. Um, but um, I did want to just mention, and this might be taking us slightly off track, so we can reroute after this. Um, but you mentioned things like misconceptions, and um, I one thing we find often with working with clients is that. They have, they might have an audience in mind. Maybe we have, we have the audience conversation. They know who they want to talk to, but they might have an idea of what they think that audience wants to hear or what their <laughs> priorities are. And that's not always the case. Um, so we're big advocates for doing stakeholder interviews or somehow engaging with that audience to check those assumptions and see if that's, you know, accurate. Um in some cases we've started out with, oh yeah, this is the kind of product we should make from the client. You know, they've worked with these people, they have this understanding. We do a few stakeholder interviews and it's actually, you know, a different, a different product that they need and are asking for. Um, so it's really important just to ground truth some of those assumptions and, and make sure you're making something that's going to actually be useful for the target audience. Mm. I actually, I think that's a great segue, you know, to an, another um, kind of set of questions, right? Which is, um, you know, what do people get wrong about the 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 work that you do, right? And I, I think, Lauren, that was a perfect example of what 
what people might get wrong, you know, about uh, what they're asking asking you to do. Will, what do people get wrong about, you know, visual storytelling or or photojournalism for that matter? I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to limit it, but um, I think a lot of it, well, what one aspect is comes down to the difference between knowing how to use a camera versus knowing how to use photography. So uh, mm. there, there are lots of people who have a camera, know how to use it. Um, there are a lot fewer people who are, you know, trained specifically to, to look at photography and um, incorporate, you know, those biases and, and really uh, study how people read pictures on a page and, and make sure you're, um, you know, not being misleading or, or inaccurate, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's more than just, you know, going out, taking good pictures. It's, it's knowing what to do with them afterwards. Mm. And, and Annie, I'm, I'm kind of going to add on to the question for you because Larry Sanford in the chat said, I have often found that working on synthesizing data into a conceptual diagram clarifies my scientific understanding. Have you had a similar experience or is that something people get wrong? Like, they don't know how it could clarify their their understanding and thinking if they would go through the process of of doing a diagram. <laughs> yeah, I think um, conceptual diagrams absolutely clarify our thinking, or they have that the the ability to do that. If you um, you know kind of take a step back and look at the system as a whole and and conceptualize it rather than um, you know really explaining it and getting in the weeds, a lot of times you you see connections you never noticed before. Um, you're able to contextualize things that are happening by, you know, again, looking at it from a broader scale um, and, it, you know, thinking about things in a different way than you're used to is a great way to kind of um, prompt new thoughts or new ways of thinking, right? If you step outside of your own, your own normal bubble, um, it helps a lot or trying to understand what someone else might get out of what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. And then as far as like, what people get wrong um like i think sometimes what 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 i do is is synthesizing data and and concepts and i think that sometimes there's a perception that we are oversimplifying things or um that it it it's too far from from science, um, but it is it is science. It's synthesizing other data sets and other other concepts into something more broad scale that people can use for a variety of purposes. Um, but everyone in our office is a trained scientist who has, through you know coincidence or coercion, um, acquired visual skills. So uh, <laughs> I think maybe that's a, a misconception that we get sometimes. That's great. I know uh, one time I committed, I was um, supposed to um, uh, basically summarize a, a morning at a workshop and I committed to doing it through drawing instead of taking written notes. I had to draw it. Um, I came away with a totally different understanding of what had been said in the session, um, but I was also mentally exhausted. <laughs> so um, because it it required a lot of processing and synthesizing. Um, to draw it. And so I appreciate that. Um, I would say I am so thankful that um, the three of you have the gifts you have and that you share them with us and, and use them in service um, to what we all do. Um, and I would just say, anybody have, do you just want to give one sort of closing um, thought or gift um, to our audience who are about to um, take holiday breaks? So I'll go in the order you, you spoke. Lauren, any last gift? Uh, just visuals are really important. So maybe, you know, while you're taking your break, think about all the visuals you're seeing. Be a little more conscious of, of all the photos, images, you know, the photos of Christmas cards you're getting, or, you know, just think about how visuals are impacting you. And then maybe for a New Year's resolution, think about how you can use visualizations to communicate what you need to communicate. Great. Will? Uh, as you you know look at the the news, um, you know 
there's a lot, a lot of good news and, and bad news always. Um, let, trying to think of who who is making the images, who, who are they for, and um, you know what might you not be seeing because it's it's hard to photograph. Mm. Interesting. And Annie, you get the last word. <laughs> um, I guess I would just say that science visualization and data visualization um, is something that anyone can can do. Um, and in, I'd encourage people to kind of explore creative avenues because I have met a lot of scientists at this point, And I think most or all of them have some kind of creative avenue that they like to pursue. So if that's you, I would encourage you to explore that. Uh, whatever your creative outlet is and just see where it takes you. Oh, thank you. Thank you all again. And um, we will see all our roundtable attendants in the new year. Happy holidays, everyone. And thanks again to our panelists. It was wonderful. Thanks, thanks everybody. Have a good week. <laughs>